Hastings on the Dairy Business Communications. We're happy to be presenting this program with our sponsors and with our partners, Pro Dairy folks. We're going to do a couple of introductions. We'll do some a little bit of preview of how the day is going to go, and then we'll turn the program over to the folks that you came to hear. But we do appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you for coming. Uh, we couldn't do this without the help of our sponsors, and uh, one of our important sponsors is the Farm Family Insurance folks, and with Farm Family this morning is Daniel Van Brocklin. Dan, thank you for being here, and thanks to Farm Family. We also work uh, happily with uh, DFA and Gary Lee, and I'm not sure that I see anybody here, but is there somebody here from uh, either of those organizations? Wave your hand and we'll say howdy. And uh, the folks at Pro Dairy, we very much appreciate their support and help and their programming content, which you'll be hearing in a moment. Uh, from Pro Dairy, we have here today uh, Dr. Tom Overton, who heads up the program. We've got Carolyn Potter, Carl Zimick on staff, Julie Baird. And you'll meet some of the other folks uh, on the program this morning. We certainly value our partnership with Pro Dairy. I'd like to introduce a few of my colleagues who are here today. Cliff Passano, our publisher at Dairy Business. Cliff's based in Vermont. Deb Morneau and Jessica Torres with our staff over in East Syracuse. And Debbie is, works from a remote office, lucky for her. And uh, Katie Hitt, who's here. And she's back there doing the video work. And uh, she persuaded us that she should be here today. Katie is in charge of our digital activity at Dairy Business, and she has a special interest on the panel today, so we thought it'd be great if she came over. She did too. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to have our program. There'll be some presentations. There'll be the opportunity to ask questions, both uh, and certainly at the conclusion. So make a note of your questions. An important part of the program every year is the interaction with the audience. So we always have good questions. We welcome that discussion. And uh, so please make a note of your questions and we'll, we'll try to get to everybody. Between the presentations and the discussion, we'll probably move along toward the, the 12 noon hour. We'll be bringing lunch in here. You'll probably see that coming in at quarter to 12 or 11.30 or so. Everybody here is invited to join us for lunch. Hope you have a sandwich. And we'll be getting started with the phase two presentation today uh, after lunch at, at about 12.30. You're welcome to stay. Obviously, you can uh, make that decision. We, we hope you do stay. The deal with lunch. Our deal is lunch is free, but we really would like to have your registration card. The registration cards are found in your green packets. There should be a pen there too. You can fill them out at your leisure. We value the information about your uh, farming activities or your connection with the dairy business. Uh, it's important to us, it's important to the sponsors, it's important to Pro Dairy that we know kind of who's here. And it's, it, we, we will not misuse your information. We won't turn it over to the EPA, but uh, it helps us a lot in planning these programs. There is a place on the back where you can indicate your opinion about the presentation, about the program, suggestions for other programs, and we do take those very seriously too. So please, during the conversations here, during the discussion, during the presentations, fill out your card, and then we'll collect that as we go through the lunch line. I expect we're going to have plenty of sandwiches, we've got plenty of milk, so there's, there's no need to feel that uh, uh, you, you might miss. We welcome you here. We're happy to provide the, the lunch opportunity, but we really would like to have your card. I think that's kind of our introductory comments. We're uh, pleased that you're here. As I said, uh, we publish uh, in behalf, on behalf of Empire Farm Days the official program. There are copies of the official program at either table. Feel free to grab it anytime on your way out or as you might need it. It's got lots of information about all the exhibitors and all the activities here at the show. Uh, Dairy Business also publishes Dairy Business East Magazine, Holstein World Magazine, and our newest uh, project, Dairy Business Weekly, a digital-only publication. And you'll have a chance on that card to indicate that you would like to receive the publications, and we invite you to take a look at them. So, that's our introduction. 
we're delighted that you're here. We expect we'll see more folks as the morning goes on. And at this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Betsy Holland of the Pro Dairy staff, and we'll get started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Fire Farm Days. My name is Betsy Howland. I joined the Pro Dairy staff two years ago in the area of dairy farm business management, and I work with the Dairy Profit Monitor Program, which measures net milk income or feed costs on farms on a monthly basis. Today, the format for our panel is we're going to have Christy Cagle from Diamond Bee uh, talk about her experiences from working with farms in the Midwest in Wisconsin. Uh, for about a half hour, and then we will introduce our three panelists, uh, young dairy farmers from here in New York. So Christy Cagle is a regional sales manager with Diamond Bee. She advises Midwest dairy producers, nutrition consultants, and feed mills on meeting facilitation, organizational structure, labor management, leadership development, and overall communication techniques. Christy is a fifth generation farm girl and also focuses on creating strong industry network alliances to help dairy producers make informed business decisions. Christy. So can everybody hear me okay? They, um, they tell me I can't stand in front of either of the two speakers, so. And I have a tendency to like to really kind of walk around, so you're going to be forced to have me standing up in front here for about the next 30 minutes. Um, just as Betsy mentioned, I am from Wisconsin. I live about 43 minutes from my doorstep to Lambeau Field, so um, so don't hold that against me, but I am a huge Packer fan, and um, we're looking forward to another new season this year, and um, hopefully an exciting one. But to give you an idea of where it is that I, where it is that I live and where it is that I've always lived, for all of my life. I live in a county that has about 34,000 cows, three times as many people. So we only have about 10,000 people in our county. But I'm very fortunate to live in a very diverse area because the average herd size in our area is still less than 200 cows. So as I travel within the state of Wisconsin and share the state of Wisconsin with two other teammates, I get to work with people who have 35 cows, and I get to work with people who own 24,000 cows, all within the state of Wisconsin. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about this morning is really about the principles of any business. But hopefully, it will resonate with your business. As we think about who started a business and how it is we transfer it from generation to generation, it's how do you carry on that legacy. So, fair enough? Okay. So what I'd like to kind of go through is just talk a little bit as it relates to the journey that all of us are on and how it is we might be able to carry that legacy forever. We'll talk a little bit about, and I'm going to challenge you to think about who is on your team. I'm just going to briefly touch upon the dynamics of different generations, because it's even within this room with 30 people, I'll guarantee you we probably have every generation represented. Okay? And then we'll talk a little bit about something that nobody ever wants to cover, and that's communication. Communication within families. Some families make this look really easy. In other families that I work with, I could tell you stories and I could probably write a novel. And they'd be one chapter in itself. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It's just that it's part of our business, right? And I'm going to challenge you and talk to you a little bit about tactical discussions and strategic discussions. So how many of you recognize these two pictures that are up here? I see a couple of hands. What's it from? From the Super Bowl, right? How many of you did that touch right here? Absolutely. And why? Think about this. It was the number one commercial with more tweets, more hits, more sharing on Facebook than any other commercial in history during the Super Bowl. 
that and this right here is why it is we have to figure this subject out. How do we transfer our business from one generation to the next so that these pictures right here, the things that pull on our heartstrings, get carried from one leg, from one generation to the next. It's a term that I like to use. It's about how do we start to transfer and transition from working in our business on all the things that we do day to day, every day, day in and day out. Why we get mud on our boots, why we get, you know, manure on our shoes and all that other good stuff, to spending more time or a portion of our time working on our business. And I'm going to explain that. It's how do we start with transferring the skills? And I'll challenge you, what's your strategy if you're the person that's in charge or holding the reins in the business today, and you've got someone in the family or outside the family that's ready to take over the business, what's your strategy to teach him or her or multiple children what it is they need to know to carry on your legacy? How are you going to transfer the skills? I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to talk about the legal stuff, okay? It's not about how do we set things up to transfer legally. I'm talking about the skills. How do you teach them the financial stuff they need to know? How do you teach them the relationship building they need to do? How do you teach them negotiation skills so they get the best price on that bag of seed corn? All of those sorts of things. Getting milk out of cows is easy, right? In Wisconsin, we seem to think so. I bet you guys do here too. I know you do. Okay. We work with really good people that help us do that. We work with veterinarians. We work with nutritionists. We got great milk supply companies that help us when we have challenges in milk quality. We work with good crop consultants, all that sort of stuff. But how many of you challenge yourselves or have someone as part of your team, your advisory group, that help you work with your people on organization, on what their responsibilities are, on holding them accountable, giving them feedback, both positive and negative, not just negative, okay? Because I know on our dairy, sometimes it felt like Dad just gave me all negative feedback. And it was really loud, okay? So all on that communication side. So how are you going to start to transition on looking at the broader perspective beyond the business? So I want you to think about all of the people in your operation that receive a paycheck. They're part of your team, right? Even the person who sweeps the floor, the person who runs for parts. Anyone who gets a paycheck is part of the team. So I'll challenge you, do you have all the right people in the right positions on your team? And I want you to think not just about yourself if you're an owner, but I want you to think about the entire team. I want you to think about the people that you have as, as managers, running an area in your business. I want you to think about all of the employees. And if you ask me who it is, I think probably has the toughest job in any operation, is the person who's the manager. And why do I say that? Because they're the person that has to make sure that we're doing what the owners want us to do. But if they have a team of employees that they're managing, they also have to keep those employees happy. So they're the person that gets to hear from both ends, right? Okay. Think about who you have in that position as a manager. Is it the right person? Is it the person that needs to be in that position in the future? Or do you, should you be thinking about it being someone different? 
When you look outside of agriculture, and I'll use diamond bee as an example, when you first started diamond bee, they came to a nice school micro packet of information, and one of the things they put in there is an organizational chart. And what's the one person that I always look for? The person that writes my paycheck. Because if I know who that is, if there's a problem with my paycheck, I know exactly who to call, right? Okay. I also know who it is I need to call if I've got a problem with a certain issue or a challenge with shipping. And I know everybody that's a part of our team. Anybody in this room have an organizational chart for their operation? If you do, I encourage you to raise your hand really high because you are the poster child for today, okay? Are you in agriculture? Let me ask you that. <laughs> okay, and, it, and it's just something that, you know what, in agriculture, we just, we have not done this. But if you step outside of agriculture, organizational charts really assist us in answering the question, do we have the right people on the team. Organizational chart is merely a puzzle, okay? And think about it from this standpoint. It's a business tool that helps us identify who does what, how many people we have in each department and who they report to or what the chain of command is, okay? And it doesn't have to be fancy. Frankly, when I get to visit with people, I just say, hey, I need a list of all the people that receive a paycheck in your operation. Well, then someone in the office will print it off. No big deal, or they'll hand me a sheet of paper. I say, okay, now we've got to figure out where everybody fits. And some people wear multiple hats, right? The smaller your business, the more hats you get to wear. It's the more boxes that you get to fill. It's the more pieces of the puzzle that you get and you have that you're just in control of. But it's merely a map, merely a puzzle piece. And you have to think about your team and do you have the right people on your team? Because that assesses what it is today before we can start to think about tomorrow, before we can start thinking about transferring things over, right? If you have a larger operation, it might look more like this, okay? Some are even bigger. But I encourage you, I challenge you to take the time to do that specific exercise, okay? And ask yourself this question once you do it. What is your succession plan for your organizational chart for your team, for your legacy? As the leaders of your business, of your operation, this is something you strongly need to think about. If you're not able to find extra hours in a day or time in a day, this is one exercise that can help you start that. As you start to figure out who's in what positions and if you have the right people in the right positions. Okay? I'm going to shift gears a little bit. How many of you had the pleasure of getting to use a typewriter? The majority of us in this room, right? Okay. When I started going to college, and I'll start to date myself a little bit, okay, I almost made it all the way through college without having to do a paper on a computer. How many of you have never typed on a typewriter? I'll guarantee you some of our panelists have never typed on a typewriter. <laughs> okay. I guarantee you that my 11-year-old daughter has never typed on a typewriter. It doesn't mean that one's right or one's wrong in any generation. We just have to realize that when you think about our farms, when you think about our operations, there's a broad spectrum, right? Okay? And so now I just want to share a little bit with you why it is I am so passionate about getting this part figured out. Okay? 
Industry research shows that 80% of the current farm operators plan to transfer their business and operations to the next generation. 20%. 20% are confident in their succession plan. 40% of our farm operators today have no plan at all. Is it fair to say that you're leaving your legacy to chance with no plan at all? And is that how you want to pass your legacy on? This is a subject that our industry really has a lot of attention on right now, a lot of focus on. And this is why. So in order to really dig deeper into that, we have to think about who it is is all really part of our team. Who it is is really all part of the business when you think of the different generations. And so I'm just going to do a little bit of, little bit of uh, history and maybe introduce you to a couple new ones as well. So who it is that we're talking about when we talk about generations? We've got traditionalists and veterans. Those are the people that were born between 1922 and 1945. Do we have anybody in the room that falls in this category? This is what makes it fun about being a part of my presentation because it's not just about me talking, it's about everybody participating, okay? So raise your hands high. This is what makes, this is what makes a great recession, okay? Because there's a lot to learn from each generation, okay? What is it that took place during that period of time that molded your mindsets. What is it that you remember or what is it that we've learned from this generation because of what took place? Say it out. Yeah, depression. Yeah. World War II. Yeah, absolutely. You bet. Then we have our baby boomers. Big part of our population today, right? Big generation. 1946 to 1964, how many of us fall in that category? Okay, more hands go up. What is it that took place during that period of time? Who are the most influential people? Shout it out. This group of people is known as the me generation, right? Vietnam War, Cold War, space travel, right? Think about the things that influenced this group and this generation of people during that period of time. How about Gen Xers? How many are in the room? We got a few more, yep. The category that I fall into, right? What is it that this group of people are known for as Gen Xers? 51 million people fall into this category. Y2K, latchkey kids, we're known as, right? The computer age, absolutely, absolutely, okay? First group, of, first group, first generation to be introduced to the computer. Also known as the ones, like I said, latchkey kids that had to take care of themselves because who was working? Mom. Generation where mom entered into the workforce, right? Because they liked the work part of the baby boom, okay? Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, those are just facts, okay? In order to know who it is as part of our team, as who's part of our family, why it is we have conflict, why we have differences, and why we have challenges, let's just do the facts, right? Okay? So that's Gen Xers. Now we have the next generation, do we, Gen Ys. Do we have any millennials? See, we got a wide variety in here, even with this small group of people. And you'll notice that, okay? What is it that, that molded our Gen Ys? Facebook? Texting? Anybody in this room refuse to text for the rest of their life? Absolutely. You bet. Could you talk to my daughter over there because she's got these things in her ears and she's already doing that, right? Because she's part of that last group, the silent generation, Generation Z, okay? This group right here, think about this. 
Our population from 1981 to present does not know what it's like to live without a digital device. And then we're asking two, sometimes three different generations, maybe even four generations, to all get to all figure it out, to all work together, to all get along in any given day on the farm. I think it's a recipe for disaster. Okay? But we have to figure it out, right? Because how are we going to transfer it? How are we going to make sure that they have the skills that we need them to do? Because they're certainly not going to learn it the same way that we did, right? Okay? So we have to come up with creative ways to teach them the skills that we need them to learn. Okay? One of the exercises that sometimes when we have longer um, amount of time when we're together and we get to talk is I'll go through and have you write down how much time every day you spend on a digital device. Okay? It's an exercise that really becomes pretty factual, pretty true. When you look at it, baby boomers spend in any given day or any given week just under eight hours on a digital device. That includes TV, radio, your phone, texting, anything, okay? Gen Xers, almost 15. Gen Y, we had a few, we got a few of those in here. I'm actually surprised they're not texting as I'm talking. 80% of their day 80% of their waking time is spent on a digital device. How on God's green earth do any of you get any work done? Right? <laughs> because they want to have the multitasking. They want to be doing different things. They want to be plugged in. They want to know when something happens in the rest of the world. They want to know about it now. And they're going to know about it right now because it was posted on Facebook. And if it's on Facebook, it's real. So, you got Okay? So think about that. Think about that as, as these are just facts, okay? And how is it? I mean, there's, there's tons of information that exists, okay, as it relates to what the facts are on our different generations that make up our family operations. And again, I go back to it doesn't mean that one's right or one's wrong. It just means that our skill sets are going to be a little bit different on how we capture them. Some folks are going to have learned it from the school of hard knocks and rolling up their sleeves and getting it done. Others are going to prefer to have learned it from going to school and learning it on a digital device. Somehow we have to figure out how it is we're going to marry the two, right? And our panelists are going to give us a little bit of insight on how it is that they've done some of that. There's actually a quote that I really like that I think of, that applies to be true. Each generation imagines itself to be more intelligent than the one that went before it, and wiser than the one that comes after it, right? But if you think about it, how it is we're going to work together, how it is we're going to communicate together, especially amongst our families, while having a healthy relationship is something that I'm going to give you a couple of ideas to think about. But I want you to remember this. There is no one way and there's no only way to get this done. There might be someone sitting in this room that has a really good idea because it's working really good for their family or within their operation. There might be something that you're going to take away from our panelists today as well. But just as I received my, my email, from the youngest daughter of an operation over in Michigan that I visited last week, who rose her hand when I left and I said to that family, I'm not leaving here to get back on the plane until this family decides which day next week, at what time, you're going to sit down and have a meeting. And then, someone's going to let me know that that meeting happened at 7 o'clock this morning, because that's the date and date, time they decided they were going to meet. And she sent me an email that was this long, but it was the first family discussion. I can tell you that that girl's 21 years old.
she took the initiative and raised her hand and said, we have to meet. So when you think about when, why, who should take the lead, how and why, it doesn't have to be the eldest in the operation. It can be the youngest in the operation, but someone has to challenge it. Someone has to take that step to working on the business. Because many of us, including myself, to be honest with you, I love to work in the business. There's nothing that makes my day better or more exciting than when I get to go walk through the maternity area. And I get to work with cows in the transition area. Because that's where my heart is, is with the cows. So it's about why do you have a scheduled family meeting? Why would we do that? Because it develops the communication within the family. It might be a little different communication, but it becomes routine. And you build different relationships, or maybe it fosters a reason to even have a relationship with someone that you don't have a relationship with in the family today, but you work side by side. It gets everyone discussing the same thing. It's bringing focus, it's bringing attention to this particular subject or whatever subject matter you're gonna talk about, okay? The other reason is it's gonna save time. And how many times have you had misunderstandings because, well, I told Brother John that that's what we were gonna do, and John, why didn't you tell Bill? By golly, Bill should have told Joe. And he would have told Susie, who takes and writes a check, right? Then we wonder why there's misunderstanding, why there's happened, right? So this is a reason to have those meetings. They don't have to be long meetings. Absolutely not. It also allows for the business to move forward as a business first family operation. That's a term that's coined by Julian Brown. And I just spent a lot of time talking about it today. But it's, it's a terminology that I encourage you that at the end of your presentation, I've got the resources in there to look that up. The other thing, and why? It reduces the threat of a legacy ending. Because at least you're making an attempt to have a plan. To not be part of that 40% that doesn't have a plan. Okay? So think about why, from why, so what is the purpose? And I want you to think about it from this standpoint, okay? There's tactical discussions and there's strategic discussions. Tactical discussions focus on how to solve challenges and problems that are day-to-day, -day, okay? Immediate things. Just think about it from this perspective, okay? We're gonna be making, we're gonna be making corn silage here pretty soon, right? At least within the next two months, right? Okay, very tactical in nature because we need to know who's gonna be doing what, when they're gonna be doing it, and how we need to get it done, right? Very tactical in nature, okay? Those discussions you're all having every day, all the time, but there's certain things that you might have a little bit of a challenge that still need to have be discussed that maybe you need to come together as a group. For example, so the cows in Pen 4 have been out to feed four days this last week. We're certainly not gonna wait for the nutritionist to come, because he comes, you know, every two weeks to have that discussion. We're at a family meeting, because we have a family meeting every week. It lasts for 20 minutes. And we figure out that Bill's gonna take care of this. He's gonna have a discussion with John, because John's in charge of feeding the cows, and we're gonna make sure we don't run out of feed anymore, right? Very tactical. Get her done, okay? Then there's strategic. These are longer range focus. It's on how do you solve the challenges that are bigger picture, okay? That are gonna take longer to solve, okay? Things like risk management strategy, expansion plan, what we're talking about today, business transition or succession planning, okay? Employee training. Anything related to human resources. Some of the budget stuff, some of the financial stuff, okay? Things that are a little bit larger in nature, okay? Think about those items as more strategic in nature, okay? I'll challenge you to think about your discussions that you have. If you do have meetings, how much time is spent on tactical things, immediate problem solving, 
and how much time is spent on more strategic or bigger planning, longer term vision. You need to have both. And at certain times, you might have more of one than the other, but at the same time, we need to make sure we have a balance. I know you probably can't see this in the back, which is in your notes. One of the things that's very critical so that everybody become, comes prepared, even at a family meeting, is to have an agenda, right? Because then everyone's going to come prepared, and there's some very simple things. This is an example of one, okay? And I'll read it to you. Our next family meeting is focused on business transition is scheduled for Friday, August 23rd. It'll run from 12.30 till 2. Bill and Jane will be providing lunch. Pretty straightforward, right? Everybody knows when they need to be there. Everybody need, knows when they need to, when we're going to be finished and who's bringing lunch. It also discusses our agenda items that we're going to go through. We're going to set the next meeting date, and if you have any other items that you'd like to add to the agenda, let the person know, right? Ahead of time. Again, it doesn't mean that everyone in the family needs to be at those meetings, but I will tell you this, there's some pretty critical things when you think about a meeting. Anyone who has a vested interest, okay, for the long-term success of the business probably gets a seat at the table for discussion, okay? You need to make sure that it's a safe environment for open sharing. Each member is engaged in dialogue. That means whoever's going to be in charge of facilitating if we have somebody in the family who doesn't want to participate or wants to be quiet, we got to pull it out of them. we got to ask them to participate because everybody gets to participate. Everybody has a voice. I guarantee you they have an opinion. It's about active listening. It's about having, again, the right people present and that agenda shared ahead of time. <clears throat> this might seem strange to do, but if you define the goals very clearly, of who's going to be the facilitator, who's going to take the notes, and who's going to hold us accountable to the amount of time you set aside, you'll bring much more structure to your meeting. You'll find a lot more value and you'll get a lot more done very early on. And it doesn't mean that dad gets to or needs to be all three of those because he's the eldest. Just like the example I shared with you, for, with you about this morning, okay? So important, so critical, especially when you're talking about tactical things. Who is going to do what by when? And to very clearly define that. Holding people accountable, and you know what? There's just stuff you're going to discuss in that meeting that the rest of the team doesn't need to know about, right? So don't share it. And then willing to run a business as a business, but always holding family, very, very true. Wrapping up here quickly, frequency of meetings, it's going to depend. If your timeline on working on transferring the skills, transferring the business is longer term, you probably don't need to have meetings all the time. If it's something you have on a very short scheduled timeline and you want to get it done in the next year or two, you've got a lot of work to do, don't you, in a short period of time. Okay, But start by having those discussions. And there's a handful of things we definitely do not want to have in a meeting. One is tardiness. One person that takes control of the conversation is unacceptable, right? And don't allow the meeting to go on and on. But think about it from this perspective of having a family meeting, or having those discussions. It's really about transferring from working in the business to starting to work on the business to force yourself to look at who's on your team. Do you have the right people on the team? And how it is you're going to transfer those skills that you have that we need to teach that next generation because we know they're not going to learn the same as what I did or what you did. Okay. And I know we're going to transfer over to our, our panel, but I just wanted to get things kicked off to get you thinking about how it is things run in your operation or the businesses that you get to work with. And now we're going to hear from our panelists on how it is in their business. Okay? Well, our panelists are, are coming up here. Um, we have three panelists today with us from 
across the yard and across all sizes and kind of each one of them has a unique operation and way that they are transferring what Chrissy talks about is transferring the skills um, in the, of their operations to the next generation. So each of them have a couple of slides just to introduce you to them and then we'll open it up for questions from, uh, from the panel and, and Christy and I will add in where needed. So we'll have Sonia start off. All right, good morning. My name is Sonia Gali. I'm from Garrettsville, New York, which is near Cooperstown. Um, I'm the herd manager on my parents' dairy farm in Silver Spoon. We milk about 70 cows, raised all our own crops. There we go. There we are. We do a little bit of showing. We have registered Holsteins. We do have a few short horns. That was my brother's 4 H project. Um, my dad purchased the farm 41 years ago, and up until a few years ago, the help was my mom, dad, the six kids, and one full-time employee. I graduated from Virginia Tech in 2008 and then went to Maine to work on Kona Acres Farm, which is a registered Holstein herd up there. I was there for two years and then moved home and just celebrated my third anniversary home in August. Um, today we're milking 70, about 70 cows. Our herd average has increased 4,200 pounds since I've been home. Um, Right now, we're all family labor. We have two part-time guys that help out on weekends, and we do have a summer intern every year. We remodeled the tie stall about two years ago, and yeah, we raised all our replacements, so there's about 120 total head. Um, so the business structure, my dad's the sole proprietor. I'm the employee, and January 1st of this coming year, we will be an LLC between my parents and myself. Um, and I, my cows will be my contribu contribution to the LLC, so I own currently about 30 head. Um, and then we're setting it up so that I'm gaining equity through profits interest. And I guess the main thing that we're just approaching this is a very big learning experience and to just keep learning from all the resources we can. Because my dad grew up on a farm, but when he turned 18, he left and started farming on its own. So we have no prior experience to go on with this process. And the future of the farm, right now we're not planning on expanding. Our kind of motto is to do, instead of getting bigger, to get better. Um, we do have some equip projects underway. That's a covered barnyard project that's going on the end of the barn. We really enjoy developing their registered cow families and keep making milk. And that's the basis of it. Uh, from Hudson Falls, New York, uh, Washington County. Um, I we milk about 160 cows, 180 total head, um, another 130 head of young stock. Um, I purchased the cows from my parents in July of 2011. Um, uh, I had been at home since 2008. Um, Realized that wasn't probably going to be able to work with my father in a day-to-day -day setting with us making decisions together. So we kind of tried to separate things out um, so that we could each have our own management responsibilities um, and move move forward that way. Um, the farm was purchased in 1952 by my grandparents, Norman and Marion Hitchcock. Um, my grandfather is deceased now. My grandmother's still living. Um, in 1982, my, the farm was transitioned to my parents. Um, my mom came back from Cobleskill and started started uh, adding on cows and and, and uh, 
kind of transition similar to the way that I'm doing it. Then my parents bought the cows first and rented, rented the land and the facilities and then purchased the farm. And then in 2011, I purchased the cows and I uh, rent the facilities and purchase feed from my parents. So um, we milk cows in a double six swing parlor. Um, I, to, to expand the herd, I have, uh, so when I bought the cows, there was 90 milking cows and probably 70 to 80 heifers. Um, I've doubled, doubled the herd in the last, uh, in the last two years, um, with with the margin of a purchase feed operation, I felt that I needed to have produce more milk um, to, to continue to be profitable and to continue to build equity to take the next step. Um, so to do that, I've, I've uh, rented a heifer facility from a neighboring farm, um, and that's where heifers and dry cows go in the wintertime. In the summertime, they're on pasture, and I now use both the freestyle and Thai style housing for, for cows. Um, and uh, we had a seasonal parlor um, that we milked in just the summer months that I, I closed that enough so that we could get through the winter um, and milk the extra cows. Um, and now I use both the, the Thai style and the freestyle for, for all lactating cow housing. Um, so kind of the biggest benefit to that was I've, I've been able to double the amount of equity that I can have in when my, when my uh, loan is paid off um, with almost no capital investment. So the LLC is owned 100% by me, and it consists of just the cows and a few basic pieces of equipment, uh, mixer wagon tractor, skid steer. And then uh, my parents, obviously still own the land and the facilities. Um, in the, the future, to continue to build equity to try to capture whatever opportunity presents itself, itself next, whether that be to, to buy the farm or to contribute my equity to another partnership and, and move forward that way. Thank you. Uh, diesel hit from Winsong Dairy. We're in Adams Center, which is just south of Watertown. It's a partnership that's comprised of myself, my wife Katie's here today, um, John and Deanna Gilbert, and Bill and Kelly Morgan. Um, so a little bit of background. The, the dairy was started uh, as a girl from Sibiel Springs Dairy, which is made up of John and Bill, and they started that dairy about 10 years ago and a very, very successful farm. I started working for them in uh, 2007 in, with the idea that I was gonna try to get on my own someday. So I, I bought some cows and, and learned a lot from them through the years. And so as we heard earlier, there was an opportunity on this dairy. There was no succession plan for a gentleman that was in his late 70s 